Doctors and nurses are people that you don't necessarily know, but almost everyone trusts them with their lives. But what happens when these healthcare professionals turn dark and deadly? Well, when patients at an established hospital in Clinton, Indiana, began to pass away at an accelerated rate between the years of 1993 and 1995, the hospital staff were left understandably alarmed. What they didn't know was that within the very walls of the hospital, there was someone driving these patients to their dreadful ends. This mind-boggling case is so wild that the media named the perpetrator Indiana's Angel of Death because the very person whom people assumed would save them turned out to be their biggest and last horrific nightmare. If you're new here, welcome to True Crime Stories. I post new true crime cases every week, narrated by yours truly. If you want to see some good old-fashioned true crime cases narrated by a real human person, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and will keep you up to date with all of my future videos. Vermilion County Hospital, or VCH, was located in Clinton, Indiana. It was a relatively small hospital consisting of 56 beds and a four-bed intensive care unit. But it was a great hospital with attentive staff, nurses, and doctors who tried their best to put the patients, as well as their attendants, at ease. Dealing with any sort of sickness or ailment is not only hard for the patient, but it's a roller coaster of emotions and uncertainty for the family as well. And VCH dealt with its fair share of unfortunate but inevitable losses. Sadly, when a patient is suffering from a terminal ailment, even hospitals can't help them. And there comes a time when no matter what anyone does or how good of a doctor someone is, no one can save a patient from their end. And that's the bitter reality that everyone has to face someday. On average, around 26 patients lost their lives at Vermilion County Hospital annually, which is nothing alarming if you do the math. Hospitals are not only places where people are admitted and nursed back to health, they're also places where people come when they're sadly at the end of the road of their lives and their loved ones want to do everything they can to prevent that. But in early 1995, things started to change when a head nurse at Vermilion County Hospital noticed something very strange. See, Dawn Stierick, a former head nurse of VCH, looked at the patient loss records and came across something very alarming. Out of the 147 patients who were admitted to VCH, 130 of them had passed away, and that too within a very short span. But there was another very obvious thing that stood out to Dawn, and that was the fact that all 130 of these patients were elderly people. Now, you would think that elderly people are already quite frail and they're dealing with a multitude of health issues, but this was frightening as the annual loss rate at Vermilion County Hospital had skyrocketed to a staggering 100 patients per year, and sometimes it was even more than that. These revelations really baffled Dawn, and she took this matter to the Vermilion County Hospital CEO and President on March 7th of 1995. Both were very concerned about the hiked loss rate of patients because it was really bad for the hospital's reputation. Now, Clinton is a very small city. In 2024, its population came out to be just under 5,000 people. So imagine how small of a city it was back in 1995. But if the residents of Clinton, Indiana, knew that a renowned hospital like VCH had such a high annual loss rate, then people wouldn't want to come there and trust the staff, the doctors and nurses with their lives and their loved ones. VCH officials immediately opened an investigation for the mysterious losses because they thought that maybe the VCH staff were incompetent and couldn't properly take care of the patients. At one point, nurses of VCH, including Dawn, speculated that maybe there was someone among them who was responsible for the loss of so many patients, but they didn't want to jump the gun. Luckily, VCH got in touch with the police about it and asked for their help in trying to solve the bizarre mystery because these cases didn't look like they were caused by natural causes. Yes, these patients were elderly and maybe their passings weren't alarming, but their charts and history showed that they were getting better and were on the verge of getting discharged very soon. So what happened in between that that caused the patients to suddenly code and eventually pass away? Now, since Clinton was a small city at the time and VCH employees and higher-ups didn't want to cause any commotion, the investigators decided to quietly carry on with the investigation without making things public. 
Once the detectives found out the reason behind this abnormally swelling loss rate, they could eventually come out and disclose information to the public. But for now, things were pretty hush-hush, as they didn't want any wave of unrest, anxiety, or fear to wash over the residents of a small and tight-knit community. Well, it didn't take investigators long at all to learn one shocking detail about the hospital that directly linked all of these sudden cases together. See, there was a nurse at VCH who was on duty almost 90% of the time when these losses occurred, and his name was Orville Lynn Majors. Orville Lynn Majors was born on April 24th of 1961 in Linton, Indiana. His father was a coal miner, and even though not much is known about his family or upbringing, it's speculated that Orville and his family belonged to a lower middle class family. But Orville had a dream of becoming a nurse to take care of patients. See, his dream took root during his early teens when he used to take care of his elderly grandmother. Orville, from that point on, wanted to become a nurse and especially wanted to help the elderly in the field of medicine. And so that's what he did. He enrolled in the Nashville Memorial School of Practical Nursing and graduated in 1989. Shortly after, Orville took a job at none other than Vermilion County Hospital and started practicing nursing. At one point, though, he left VCH for a higher paying job in Tennessee, but he rejoined VCH in 1993. Now, we don't know whether Orville didn't like working in Tennessee or maybe the move was difficult for him, but he seemed to really enjoy working at VCH. Fellow employees at VCH also really liked Orville. He was apparently an amazing nurse and most people loved him. He was medically knowledgeable, he was gentle with the patients, and he didn't ever cause drama. But that soon changed. In 1993, Orville was abusing illegal substances. Now, we don't know how Orville spiraled down so erratically and quickly because there's not a lot of background information on Orville. It's unclear whether he had a history of substance abuse or if he jumped straight into it because of external factors like stress or something. But because of this substance abuse, the gentle and caring Orville was essentially replaced by a monster. Orville would lash out at patients, neglect them, and pass on very derogatory remarks about some of the older patients, making jokes about them to other nurses. Orville, even though his love of nursing grew from taking care of his grandmother, he now resented these helpless and innocent people who were only trying to get better. According to employees, in May of 1993, Orville was downright mean to the patients and even addressed them and their families with extremely repulsive words that I won't repeat. It was assumed that Orville didn't like elderly people at all, and this sudden shift in personality could either be because of his hardcore substance abuse or just the way he was from the get-go, and maybe he was just really good at hiding it behind his gentle and attentive nurse mask. Maybe as he got more comfortable with the staff, he slowly let his demons emerge. Infuriatingly, some people even claimed that Orville thought of elderly people as, quote, a waste of space, and that they were whiny and childish. Now, it's important to note that this was a hospital, a place where people's lives are turning around for the worse, oftentimes. Dealing with elderly patients can be hard, but that's where nurses and staff are trained to be gentle and helpful. It's literally the job of a nurse to ensure that the patients under their care are comfortable and not having any problems with hospital services. Yes, elderly patients can be a bit more demanding, but what more do you expect from a weak and frail patient that's having a hard time with their illness? Elderly people, when they're in the throes of a serious illness, can get a bit irritable, and that's totally normal. It's the hospital and the staff's job to ensure that every patient has a good time under their care, because that's the least they can do for someone whose life was altered in a matter of minutes and hours. If anyone was being annoying in this situation, it was Orville. He was a hospital nurse, and it was his job to take care of elderly patients. And if he couldn't do it and found his patients to be demanding and annoying, then that was his failure as a registered and seasoned nurse. Several of those close with Orville spoke out against him and mentioned that he always had a cocky or rude response when it came to his patients, specifically his patients who were higher up in age. While this sort of behavior is shocking on its own, things were about to get much worse when Orville's behavior suddenly took a turn for the unimaginable and led to a series of devastating events that changed the lives of the people involved forever. It all started in 1993. Even though there were more than 100 patients that mysteriously and tragically passed away, we'll only be able to cover a handful of them in today's video. Luella A. Hopkins was at home spending Christmas Eve of 1993 with her family. 
but she was soon wheeled into Vermilion County Hospital with complications of pneumonia. She was in the hospital for three long weeks and was doing well, but at the end of that third week, though, Orville was on duty. Not long after she was under Orville's care, Luella tragically and suddenly passed away at the age of 89. In February, 56-year-old Freddie Dale Wilson was admitted to VCH also with complications of pneumonia, and he unfortunately crossed paths with Orville, who proceeded to examine him in front of his daughter, and minutes later, Freddie also lost his life. 74-year-old Cecil Smith was admitted to VCH in April of 1994. He was also suffering from pneumonia. Cecil's son saw Orville looking over his father, and moments later, Cecil complained to his son about feeling like his whole body was on fire from the inside out. And not even a few minutes afterward, Cecil's blood pressure got uncontrollable, and tragically, within two hours, he passed away. Dorothy Hickson, an 80-year-old mother of two, was someone who regularly visited VCH. She had a lot of issues with her lungs, and while we're unsure of what Dorothy suffered from specifically, it's pretty clear that her visits were often uneventful, and that she'd frequently have fluid removed from her lungs and would just go home after without any complaints. But April 23rd of 1994 was very different. Dorothy was accompanied by her two daughters, and she was checked in for her routine procedure. As her daughters were looking after their mother, Orville walked in with a syringe, and he then proceeded to inject Dorothy and kissed her on her forehead, saying, it's all right, pumpkin, it's all right. Now, I don't know the context of the situation, but kissing a patient's forehead like this and talking to them in that way seems a bit strange. But maybe if we'd been in the room with them, then it wouldn't have been that strange, I don't know. But this alone seems awfully bizarre to me. But not long after Orville's visit, Dorothy's eyes began to roll back and she tragically passed away in front of her own daughters, who were struck with horror and disbelief. Fast forward to November 5th, 1994. It was a quiet Saturday night for 69-year-old Mary Ann Alderson, who was enjoying her weekend with some pizza and beer. But sadly, her weekend would take a very serious turn, and Mary started to experience immense chest pains. She was rushed by her family to the Vermilion County Hospital, and when she was admitted, it was around 10.30 p.m. Luckily, Mary was stabilized after spending some time in the intensive care unit, and she was wheeled back to a room on the medical floor for overnight observation. She was breathing easily and was sound asleep. According to records, the doctors even told Mary that she could go home the next day. But Mary sadly wouldn't make it. The next day, Mary was under the supervision of none other than Orville. Not long after, tragically, Mary lost her life. What was really weird was that Mary didn't have any associated heart issues, but later her autopsy and medical reports showed that her heart rate had gone erratic just minutes before she took her last breath. On November 25th, 1994, Margaret A. Hornick was admitted for a broken hip. And now a broken hip is a very serious condition, but it's also very treatable, especially if you go to a hospital immediately, which was exactly what Margaret did. But the very next day, on November 26th, Margaret tragically lost her life at the age of 79. Margaret's family doctor came forth and said that her loss was very suspicious, and it turned out he was right. See, when investigators started looking more closely into all of these unexpected passings of these patients, they noticed a common denominator that I'm sure all of us have picked up on by now. Orville Majors. Orville was the attending nurse for every single patient who passed away at this hospital. Several witnesses spoke out against Orville as well, saying that they'd often see him injecting patients with syringes that were not prescribed by their doctors. But the thing is, hospitals are very busy places, so every person present can't be 100% sure whether or not a syringe of medication was ordered for a patient by their doctor or not. Their syringes and needles were on every corner. So many of these sightings went unreported, or they were dismissed or otherwise forgotten about because of this. Considering most of these patients were elderly, it's understandable that no one really thought much about these injections at the time. Elderly people tend to take a lot of medications, especially in a hospital setting. But Orville wasn't just responsible for the passing of strictly elderly patients. It's believed that during the time Orville worked in Vermilion County Hospital from 93 to 95, about 147 patients of all ages lost their lives, up from just a couple dozen losses from a couple years back. It turns out, Orville was on duty for 130 of these cases. Remember the secret investigation the VCH officials and investigators were conducting? Well, the police wanted to take a closer look at some of the patients who passed away at VCH. 
In fact, it was decided that 15 bodies should be removed from their graves for autopsies and blood samples. This was a difficult time for many of the victims' families, but police had no other choice. During this time, Orville was actually temporarily suspended from VCH, but shockingly, he was still getting paid by the hospital, likely to not draw too much attention to the fact that he was under the investigation of police. In the hospital's defense, the staff members were already suspicious of Orville at this point, even joking about the fact that patients would mysteriously lose their lives when Orville was on duty. But nobody was taking it too seriously just yet, and the detectives really didn't want Orville to know that they were on to him. The plan was to build a case against Orville and try to catch him when he least expected it. After a thorough examination, it turned out that 130 of the 147 patients had erratic and widened heart patterns right before their deaths, and most of them didn't even have pre-existing heart conditions to begin with. On top of that, the patients with heart conditions didn't have any blood clots in their hearts or lungs, which proved that their losses weren't natural. The blood work came in handy too, and the investigators pinpointed the very thing that caused the loss of the patients. See, in all of the patients that were under Orville's care, there were high levels of potassium chloride and epinephrine in their systems. Potassium chloride is basically poison for the body. It causes irregular heartbeat, and larger doses can lead to cardiac arrest, which is exactly what all of Orville's victims suffered from. One of the detectives on the case, Frank Turchi, even expressed that the crimes were the doing of someone who was very boastful. And well, it turned out that Orville was a controlling, egotistical, and authoritative person who thought very highly of himself. According to Orville's co-workers, he would go around claiming to be a doctor in front of patients, which was a complete lie. Amidst these shocking revelations, Orville's suspension was prolonged by the VCH officials as to put a stop to his maniacal killing spree. Oddly, this action didn't raise suspicion in Orville's mind immediately. But Orville soon started to figure out that the investigators were catching on to him. So he decided to take matters into his own hands and made a beeline for TV stations. And there, he made public appearances maintaining his innocence, blaming the hospital for being incompetent and not taking proper care of patients, and even lawyered up. This turned against Orville pretty quickly, though, and the police were now certain that Orville was to blame. Orville's actions also caused a lot of uproar in the community, and people were genuinely scared for their life and their loved ones' lives, as the hospital was being slandered for the staggering death toll by the media. But things seemed fine for Orville in the beginning, because he was loving the media attention. But soon, the Indiana State Nursing Board suspended Orville's nursing license, and he was fired from VCH, too, on the grounds of illegally administering emergency drugs to patients, and by working in the ICU without a doctor. Investigators concluded that the possibility of a patient dying under the supervision of Orville was 42 times higher than any other nurse in the building. When Orville was working at VCH, the average daily loss rate was about one patient every 23 hours. But after Orville was fired, the loss rate plunged to one patient every 26 days. Based on the EKG readings of these patients, the case against Orville was a solid one, and on the grounds of those very readings, the investigators were granted a search warrant for Orville's home. And when they looked through the garage, there was a lot of evidence that supported that Orville was euthanizing elderly patients at VCH. The detectives recovered empty vials of potassium chloride, epinephrine, and various syringes. The investigators immediately took all those things in as evidence, and now all that was left to do was find and arrest Orville. But while the police were investigating and building a case against Orville, he'd actually moved away and opened up a pet store. But the investigators were on his tail, and after two years of gathering evidence and investigating the deaths of more than 100 patients, Orville Lynn Majors was finally arrested in December of 1997. Orville obviously pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The trial was prosecuted by Nina Alexander and Greg Carter, and they were certain that Orville was responsible for the almost 130 deaths of elderly patients at Vermilion County Hospital. To avoid confusing the jury, the prosecution narrowed the case to seven patients that Orville was solely responsible for. Luella A. Hopkins, Dorothy L. Hickson, Mary Ann Alderson, Margaret Hornick, Freddie Dale Wilson, Derek Maxwell Sr., and Cecil Smith. Orville's trial was held in 1999, and a total of 79 witnesses showed up to testify, including VCH employees and the family members of the deceased patients. It's unimaginable 
to think what was going through the minds of these victims' families. Some of them even witnessed Orville injecting lethal doses of potassium chloride into their loved ones' bodies, but they'd been lied to and told that the injection would help them. Sadly, it was the opposite of what they expected, and they had to go through bouts of irrevocable grief, all because Orville didn't like whiny elderly patients. Some of the things staff members reported Orville saying about these patients is just heartless and unnerving. According to a lot of witnesses, Orville had an immense hatred for elderly patients, and even thought that they should all be gassed. It's so unbelievably cruel that a nurse, someone who's trained to be compassionate and kind, can be such a vile and disgusting monster. These patients didn't provoke Orville in any way. They were simply there to get better. But Orville had an unexplained vendetta against these helpless, frail, and innocent patients. And he decided to go through with the unthinkable, which left the families of the patients living with a void that could never be filled again. According to the evidence presented at trial, Orville's process went something like this. A patient would be admitted to the hospital. If they were elderly, Orville considered them to be unworthy of life and nothing more than a nuisance, even if they were being totally respectful and friendly. After their admission, Orville would either sneak into their room and inject them with medication that would cause a heart attack, or he would lie to the patients and their families and inject the victims right in front of them, leading to a heart attack occurring within minutes. In Orville's mind, these patients deserved it, simply for being elderly. At the end of the trial, on October 17th of 1999, the jury found Orville Lynn Majors guilty of taking the lives of six elderly patients. The only case that wasn't linked to Orville was Cecil's case, as he passed away after being discharged from the hospital. This meant that in the end, Orville was given six consecutive sentences of 60 years. So in total, Orville was sentenced to 360 years in prison. This sentence was considered to be the maximum possible penalty in Indiana law at the time, meaning he was guaranteed to never leave the prison walls. The presiding judge, Ernest Yelton, went on to deliver a statement of his own and described Orwell's senseless and brutal crimes as, quote, diabolical acts and a parallel of evil at its most wicked. Due to the brutality of the cases and the sheer remorselessness that Orville displayed throughout the investigation and the trial, Judge Ernest went on to intensify his sentence by stating, the maximum sentence is the minimum sentence in this case. Orville was then incarcerated at Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. Even though Orville was behind bars, he was only convicted for a fraction of the crimes that he's believed to have committed. Orville's actions led to a lot of trauma for the victims' families. Lawsuits were filed by the families of 80 of Orville's victims, and the hospital was eventually fined $80,000 for negligence. All of these legal issues led to the hospital closing its doors for good before eventually being purchased and renamed Union Hospital Clinton, or UCH. Orville was still serving his sentence on September 24th, 2017, when 18 years into his 360-year sentence, he suffered a heart attack while arguing with Officer Rick Houston. We don't know what this argument was about, but Rick actually reached out the last time I covered Orville's story just a couple years ago, saying his coworkers used to joke and say that since Rick killed the Angel of Death, he must now take on the name. Rick said he's still waiting on Netflix documentary makers to come knocking on his door. It's ironic how Orville snuffed the lives out of elderly patients by inducing heart failure, and the very cause of his own death turned out to be the same thing. Orville's crime spree was very weird and somewhat confusing. He was working his dream job, but out of the blue, he took the lives of the people he was supposed to save. It leads people to wonder about whether Orville really was a monster from the get-go, or if substance abuse and other unknown things may have contributed to the way that he turned out. Regardless, it didn't give him any right to put innocent and unsuspecting families through the painful torture that they endured when their mothers, fathers, or grandparents were brutally and mercilessly taken away. It's so hard to imagine what those 130 patients felt during their last moments and then what brutal pain they went through. They came to Vermilion County Hospital to get treated for their ailments, but an evil monster under the disguise of a nurse drove them straight into the hands of death and left their families with so many questions and so little comfort. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Ray and Renee Carey. 
If you also want to become a member of the channel, you'll gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who have decided to do that. And if you want to join, you can click that big blue join button below the video or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.